If you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Welcome to Considering Catholicism. My name is Greg, and I'm here in my studio with my faithful companion, Finnegan. That's my dog, by the way, who is often with me out at the secret compound, but today's in the studio. And so if you hear a squeaking noise in the background, he's playing with his toy hedgehog, which squeaks, sort of. More like a squawking sound. But anyway, if you hear that, that's what's going on in the background. I'm here in the studio today. And I'm glad you joined me for this episode. Now, I've wanted to cover this topic for a while, but I never got around to it because it feels kind of like a sinkhole. Like there's no way to win or to satisfy about a quarter of the people who might listen to it. Now, some of you I know are going to listen to this and say, oh, right on. And maybe write me an email telling me how much you appreciate what I said. And let me tell you, that's okay, because I like getting nice emails. But nothing I can say is going to change your mind if you're a a stoner or a pothead. Look, (laughs) I grew up in Southern California in the late 70s, and I went to college in Boulder, Colorado in the 80s. So trust me, I've been around a lot of stoners and potheads in my life, and Nothing on God's green earth is more boring and tedious than arguing with potheads about pot. It's an endless, dumb, pointless argument. Because I think for them, it's not just a drug. It's become an ideology. And it's all wrapped up in notions of freedom and oppression and even some kind of goofy environmentalism. Like, dude. God's creation is good, dude, and he made this, like, really good plant, and God wants us to use the plant, and by the way, did you know that you can make all kinds of great things out of this plant, like rope and sandals and baskets and car tires and and cure glaucoma, too? Dude, it's God's green miracle plant, blah, 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 blah. Like I said, I've been hearing this my whole life. So, again, I'm not so sure that there's a big win in this if you're somebody who's really into weed. But I hope you'll listen to what I have to say, and I hope you'll understand where Catholicism is coming from on this. And if that maybe prompts some thoughts into your mind, maybe your (laughs) high mind, then maybe, just maybe, this was worth it. So, okay. With legalization over the last 10 years, legalization of recreational weed, it's also become about big, big money, money for the weed industry and the tax base that it generates and how the government is content, state governments are content to keep. Again, now I'm I'm really editorializing here, so you can just reject what I have to say but about how I think a lot of government is content to keep half the rowdy underclass in America medicated and complacent half the time. All right? I know that's a provocative statement, but yeah, it's a provocative statement, but I mean it to be. I think that in a lot of ways, legalization of weed has been uh, something that has pacified and kept complacent a lot of what you might call the underclass, the people who are underemployed, struggling, poor, likely to get rowdy. And legalized weed keeps a lot of that relatively toned down because they're stoned. Here's a little sidebar. 
About five or six years ago, I was working at an advertising agency. The partners, the agency partners, signed this huge cannabis company as a client. And so I got drawn into, for a while, being in these meetings and working initially on trying to figure out how we were going to advertise and promote this legal cannabis company. Let me jump to the end on that. If you guys are wondering, I did that for about six months. And then for that and other reasons, I left that agency, stopped working there. And this was a contributor. To it, I I didn't I could not in my conscience as a Catholic who I am work on that project. But for a few months while I was struggling and I was just sort of assigned to it and it was my job, I I got to see the inside of the legal cannabis industry for a little while. And so one of the things that we had to do as an agency is we went to a lot of the retail locations so we could observe these dispensaries. And some of these were in some urban areas. Okay. I'm going to be careful about what I say and where I say it, but they were, these were in these urban areas and this legal weed company had all of these franchise locations. So we went in there to observe, understand, so we could theoretically help advertise it. And I, I just was shocked because what I saw, and again, all this is anecdotal was I saw a lot of poor people, the, the basically broke underclass in America, standing in line to spend money that they clearly didn't have. I suspect from my observations, purely anecdotal, that a lot of them were spending their disability checks to buy highly concentrated cannabis vape cartridges for vaping. We were told by the client that the vaping cartridges are their, not only their biggest seller, like 80% of the products sold out of these stores were vaping cartridges, but they're most profitable because they're highly concentrated THC and they deliver highly concentrated THC that gets people really high, really fast, really efficiently. And so I stood there and watched all of these people who were clearly poor, probably on disability, probably spending essentially government welfare or disability checks to stand in line and buy these vaping cartridges. And you cannot believe how much money was involved. It was huge. Okay. Like well over approaching like $2 million per retail location per month. And you can't believe how much state government was wrapped up in it all because from what I observed, the, as the industry was trying to expand, they, were, they had to get these licenses and they were partnering with state agencies and all this kind of stuff. And the government was all into this because of the tax base. So just like they are with other what are called sin taxes, like the lottery and the casinos, right? This is big money for the people who sell that stuff and the government that and essentially profits on people's misfortune. Basically, it's a regressive tax on the poor because it's basically poor people coming in to spend money they don't have on things that are not good for them. And the vendor is making a bunch of money and the government is highly invested in it. So nobody has any real incentive to stop it. And I say all this just to say that when it comes to talking about weed here and a Catholic perspective on it, there's a lot more involved with this than back in the old days, a few folks passing around a joint on the patio or popping a gummy while they watch a movie. This is bigger than that. And I think it's more harmful than that. And I think it's maybe more nefarious than that. Okay. This is a big issue. It affects individuals, of course, but increasingly, This is having a huge effect on families, on communities, on schools, on workplaces, government. I don't know. I wonder. I I certainly don't have any statistics, but I just speculate personally on how much of the current underemployment crisis where employers can't find workers. I mean, almost no every employer in America is looking for workers and they try to say that this is because it's a hot economy. 
But I can't help but to wonder how much of it is that a third of the workforce under 40 uses weed in some form or another almost every day. I'm convinced that about half the weirdo behavior that I see on airplanes today is because half the plane is popping pretty potent gummies before and while they're flying. So this is becoming a thing that is really affecting, like I said, not only people as individuals, but families and communities and workplaces and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. And it sort of compounds its effects throughout society. So anyway, I'm clearly showing my hand here that I'm not a fan of all of this. I don't think weed is good. And I think legalization has largely been a disaster for society. So if you are really into weed and you're really into legal weed and you think it's the greatest thing possible, dude, probably, dude, nothing I say is going to change your mind. But I thought it was time to bring some Catholic perspective to this topic. I mean, this is considering Catholicism and we talk about all kinds of things here, the Catholic perspective that I thought. Why not today talk about the Catholic perspective uh, on weed? And uh, so I came into the studio today. I've got Finnegan in the corner here squawking on his uh, toy hedgehog. And I thought, let's just unpack this a little bit. What does Catholicism have to say about weed? Now, one of the many things that prompted me to do this episode was a document that was put out by Archbishop Samuel Aquila of the Archdiocese of Denver. And this was like three or four months ago. So this is right now the end of January 24. He put it out, I think, first of November in 23. He released what's called a pastoral letter. So from the archbishop to his people and more broadly to to people everywhere. But it's actually like 60 pages long. Uh, although they're formatted in a PDF with lots of pictures and diagrams and stuff like that. So it's maybe not 60 pages of dense reading, but it's, it's called, the title of it is That They May Have Life. Okay. Uh, Archbishop Samuel Aquila of Denver, his pastoral letter, That They May Have Life. And it lays out the Catholic perspective on marijuana and legalization and so forth. And when I read it back in November, three, about three months ago, I was, I was really impressed with this document. I thought it was very, very good. I think it was pastoral. I think it was deeply Catholic. I thought it was well thought out, well reasoned. And so I just made a note to myself, at some point here, I got to do an episode where I kind of share some perspective on Aquila's letter, or at least the same themes. Now, I've put a link to Archbishop Aquila's letter in the episode notes. So if you're on Spotify or Apple or Amazon or wherever you get the podcast, if you look at the episode description, the show notes, I've got a link in there and you can follow that and read it. Again, 62 pages, but there's a lot of pictures and stuff. So anyway, it's interesting that the Archbishop of Denver put this out because it was 12 years ago that Colorado and Washington became the first states in the U.S. to legalize recreational marijuana. Now, my wife and I lived in Colorado for many, many years, and we still have lots of family and friends there. We go there at least a couple times a year to visit. So I well remember all of the debates about this that took place at the time when they were doing legalization about 12 years ago. I remember arguing with old friends, people I've known since college, who insisted that this is going to be the greatest thing ever for the state and that anyone who objected to legalizing recreational weed is just an uptight Christian nationalist extremist or something. I mean, I wasn't even Catholic at the time, but you're just like an uptight right wing Christian extremist if you don't think that this is the greatest thing ever. And I remember a lot of people that I know that it let me put it this way, self-identify as Christians going, oh man, totally weed positive. Like, I think this is the most Christian thing ever. And like weed is like God's plant and blah, 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 that whole thing. So it's interesting that Archbishop Aquila of Denver was the one to put this out about 10 or 12 years after legalization happened in Colorado. Because in his pastoral letter, he addresses some of the negative effects that have come from legalization, at least in Colorado. And, and maybe other states. And there have been a lot of negative consequences 
I'm not going to get into all of those in this episode because I want to focus on the Catholic principles involved, and I don't want to get into all the statistics about the consequences, economic statistics and healthcare statistics and all this kind of stuff. But by all means, read what the archbishop says. He's got, he documents a lot of that in there. But I'm just going to offer this one purely anecdotal observation, right? So this is just me, one person, about the difference that I've noticed. Okay, having gone to college in Colorado and going back and forth there every twice a year for the last, you know, 35, 40 years, it's made a lot of places that I had positive memories from a lot more, I want to choose my adjective carefully, a lot more sort of seedy and crummy, where there were a lot of businesses and shops in places that have all been replaced by dispensaries. That's the euphemism, right? For the weed store. So you go to the shopping center, you go to this area and it's like, man, I remember back in the good old days, from my perspective, I'm just an old fart. But I mean, I remember back in the day, there was this kind of business and this kind of business and this kind of thing. And now there's like in this shopping center within a half mile, there's like eight dispensaries, weed stores. And one in particular just really gets me. So The day that my, I proposed to my wife, we, that's a whole long story that isn't relevant here, but we, I proposed to her on the third flat iron at Boulder. It's this huge 1200 foot rock pinnacle. And I, at the time I was a climber and I sort of made her help, I I sort of made her climb the third flat iron, which she was not happy about. And then I proposed to her, gave her the ring and all that. And then we came down and I had made reservations at this really nice restaurant that is kind of outside Boulder on the highway as you're going up to Rocky Mountain National Park up there. It was the old Prague Inn. It was just really kind of elegant sort of, at least to me as a college student, it was an elegant kind of old, old world, fancy schmancy restaurant. And now every time we go back to Colorado to visit family, we drive down that road right past it and the old Prague Inn has become, it's got a weird hippie name, like, like Starfire Dispensary or something. And this really wonderful kind of old, elegant restaurant is this seedy, like hippie kind of place, the Starfire Weed Dispensary or something. And every time we drive past it, my wife and I just kind of we sort of laugh and we're like, wow, how, how much things have changed and, and our memory of our engagement dinner is, is now sort of a, a seedy, hippie weed dispensary. Again, so I'm probably, all I'm doing is showing for to some of you that I'm just an old fart who isn't cool and doesn't like hippie weed dispensaries. All of that's pretty much true about me, but be that as it may. So let me get into the Catholic perspective here. What I'm going to share reflects what's in the Archbishop's letter and also some sections of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and some other Catholic documents unpacked much more thoroughly in the Archbishop's letter. And so if you want to go deeper on this issue, you can dive into that or other material. All right, here we go. I want to start this Catholic perspective on weed with a foundational principle of Catholic thought in general. In Catholicism, If we want to understand what a thing is, we must first understand its purpose, its final cause. That's what Aristotle called it. The Greek philosopher Aristotle called this, in Greek, the telos, the end, the telos of a thing. Its final cause, its ultimate end. And that word and that concept is stuck over the ages in Catholic philosophy. So, let me give you an example. Consider an airplane. What's the purpose of an airplane? Its purpose is to carry people up into the sky, right? That's what it's for. So in Catholicism, we would say that the essence of airplaneness, okay, the essence of airplaneness is the ability to carry people up into the sky. And therefore, the airplane has certain qualities. It has wings and an engine and a cockpit. Or whatever. And if something doesn't have wings and an engine and a cockpit, it's not really partaking of airplaneness, is it? Not really much of an airplane. 
And if you take an airplane and you break off its wings and you pull out its engine and you remove all the seats and controls from the cockpit, well, then you've sort of diminished its ability to fulfill its telos, its purpose, its end. You've, in a sense, dimmed the light of its airplaneness. Does that make sense? So let's take that same idea of telos, end, purpose, essence, and apply it to a human being. What is a human being and what is the telos of a human being? Now, Scripture tells us that humans are made in the image of God. Okay? Genesis 1, 2 are clear about that. And to embody that image of God in us, we are given certain qualities. Much like the airplane has wings and an engine and a cockpit in order to embody its airplaneness. Now, Catholicism has traditionally said that in the same way that airplanes have wings and engines and cockpits, humans have been given by their creator intellect, will, and the capacity for love or communion. When we say that we're made in the image of God, it doesn't mean that God has two arms and two legs and, you know, uh, 20 toes and fingers or two nostrils or whatever. But what we have is qualities that God has. And as I said, Catholicism has always sort of listed those uh, that among those, a principle among those are our intellect, our will, and our capacity for love or communion. So let's define this for a second. Intellect means that we as creatures have the ability to know what is true and good and beautiful. We can identify those. Now, Finnegan is sitting in the corner over here, my golden retriever. And Finnegan has animal qualities, right? And I love him to death. And he's the best. He's, he's the goodest dog ever. But, all right, he doesn't have human intellect. He can't really know the true, the good, and the beautiful. He can't distinguish those. He doesn't have that human intellectual capacity. So first quality we have is intellect that lets us know those things. We can know right from wrong. And the second capacity that humans have that embody our humanness, our telos, is will. So if intellect is the ability to know right from wrong, our will is the capacity to choose right from wrong. Okay? If our intellect lets us know what is true and good and beautiful, our will lets us choose what is true instead of what is false, what is good instead of what is evil, what is beautiful instead of what is ugly. And then the third sort of quality that embodies our humanness is our capacity for love and communion. I love Finnegan and he loves me. We talk, we all, we, we have conversations about this all the time. We're BFFs forever. We have much love for each other, but his love for me is an animal love. Okay. Human love, and I could do a whole episode on this, so I don't want to go down too far, is the capacity to truly be, to will the good of another and to truly be able to be to know and be known by another and truly enter into communion with another where we know and love each other and work for each other's good. Okay. And again, I I should do a whole episode on this because that's embodied in the Trinity. So there's one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and between them they have this love and communion, and we are made in the image of God so that we can, like God, be in true love and communion with with others. Now, just as stripping the wings, engine, and cockpit from an airplane diminishes or dims the essence of its airplaneness, anything that diminishes human intellect, will, and the capacity for love and communion diminishes or dims the essence of our humanity. We can't stop being human because that's a gift of our creator, but our ability to live and express our humanity can be compromised. So like the airplane without wings and an engine and a cockpit, 
we can't get off the ground and be what we are made to be if our intellect, will, and capacity for love and communion are diminished. A few years ago, I taught this course in Dante's Divine Comedy. And some of you have took part in that course or you've watched it online. One of the things I'd like to do with this podcast, if we have enough resources later this year, is to be able to kind of reformat some of those courses and offer them as sort of a parallel show here. So you could watch it, listen to it, a season or a show on Dante and Catholicism and Dante. But be that as it may, one of the things that we saw is that as Dante sort of imagines what hell is like, the inferno, as he goes lower in the circles of hell, people start to lose their humanity because their intellect, will, and capacity for love and communion is diminished. So in a sense, the lower that Dante goes in his tour of hell, the stupider people become, the, the less they're able to choose good, and the less they're able to relate to other people. And in a sense, they become more animal-like the lower you go. Their humanness is diminished. And so this notion of intellect and will and, and love or the capacity for love really is part of our humanity. And anything that diminishes that diminishes our humanness. So with all that said, let me make this clear. Intoxication or drunkenness, being high or blitzed or ripped or stoned or wasted or whatever you want to call it, diminishes, at least temporarily, our intellect, our will, and our capacity for love and communion. When you're blitzed or wasted or high or intoxicated or drunk, you are less able to know right from wrong. I mean, anybody who's ever been drunk or high or whatever knows that Your intellect becomes compromised. You're less able to distinguish and understand your choices. And then your will is compromised. You're less able to make good choices, (laughs) right? Anybody ever been drunk? Anybody ever been high? Watch somebody. They don't know right from wrong or their ability to distinguish those goes down. And then their ability to make good choices is diminished. And their ability to really love and relate to other people is diminished. Okay, and that's kind of funny because a lot of times when your people are drunk, they think that they're right. You've been around drunks or been (laughs) drunk, whatever you think, man, we're all just getting along so really well. And it's like, man, we're all loving each other as we're as we're ripping the bong or whatever. But it's a false sense of love and communion. It's not genuinely knowing and giving of the self because you're in a diminished capacity. So. You you aren't really knowing the other person because your capacity to know and choose is diminished and their capacity to know and choose is diminished. So it becomes sort of like this animal affiliation. Like when I take Finnegan to the dog park and he gets together with with his uh, dog cousins or whatever in our family and they all get together and they all like yap around and have a good time. They're having a good time, but they aren't truly capable in the way that a human is of genuinely knowing and loving and being communion with each other. They're just having fun. So drunkenness or intoxication or highness gives you the illusion of love and communion, but not the reality because your intellect and will is diminished. Okay. And by the way, that's true whether you're intoxicated by alcohol, marijuana, or some other drug, which is why the Bible, Scripture, and Catholic tradition condemn drunkenness. Not because the church is a bunch of uptight killjoys. I mean, after all, it's the Catholic church that serves real wine for communion, and it's monks brew beer and all that, but because drunkenness Severe intoxication diminishes our human qualities. It impedes our telos, our end as people. We lose the ability to distinguish right from wrong. We lose the ability to choose right from wrong. Uh, We lose the ability to genuinely love and be in communion with others. Okay. Turning to sort of the next sort of subtopic here. For 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has stressed what are called the cardinal virtues. The cardinal virtues. Now, these didn't originate in Catholicism. They originated in Greek philosophy, 
and, and, and Judaism and other things, but because they are considered the virtues that are available to every human being, whether Christian or not, you don't have to be Christian to practice, to know or practice these virtues. There's another set of list of three virtues that are called the theological virtues or gifts of the Holy Spirit, faith, hope, and charity. But the cardinal virtues are these things that are available to all human beings as a part of our humanness. And there's four that have always been listed for the last 2000 years, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And we talked a lot about these in the Dante course because Dante sort of masterfully illustrates in the Divine Comedy how the loss of these virtues diminishes our humanity. When we lose prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, we become, in a sense, less human. And so you see in Dante's Inferno how the people in hell sort of lose those virtues, how they get sort of restored in purgatory. And they get elevated in heaven so that the people in heaven practice those cardinal virtues perfectly and they become, they reach their potential as humans. Okay. Now you can read all about these in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 1803 through 1811. And maybe I'll do a whole episode about them sometime. But just real quick, let me define what the four are. The Catechism defines prudence as the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. It is the ability to, in a sense, because of our intellect, to know or discern the good in whatever circumstances that we're finding and then make that choice, that intellect and will. And you can see how drunkenness intoxication being high diminishes prudence you're you're not able to discern and make the best choices in every circumstance you find yourself in it defines the virtue of justice as the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to god and neighbor so it's what we genuinely owe to god morally and to our neighbor morally essentially to be Moral. And again, drunkenness, intoxication being high does not usually raise your moral game, right? I don't need to get a lot of examples for that. Drunkenness and being a high on spring break for college students does not generally sort of raise the bar of moral justice, all right? The Catechism defines fortitude as the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. So fortitude, strength. So when you're drunk, when you're high, whatever, and you're faced with moral temptation, fortitude is the ability to stick with your morals and your virtues. And again, fortitude, moral fortitude, is clearly eroded when you're drunk or high or whatever. All right. Everybody has a story. All of us have a story about when we were intoxicated by one substance or another where we didn't practice fortitude. And finally, the Catechism describes temperance as the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. So basically, it's the ability to say, I've had enough. That's temperance. So I'm backing off, right? No more for me. And as we all know, being drunk or high does not generally lead to temperance. We don't know when to stop. One drink leads to another. One hit leads to another. One pill leads to another. And we lose temperance. So if we look at those four cardinal virtues that have to do with exercising our humanity, every one of them is eroded by intoxication, drunkenness, being high. Okay, let's start pulling this all together and answering the initial question, which is, but what about weed? Why pick on weed when alcohol can also lead to drunkenness? I mean, this is the thing that I, you're always going to hear from the pro-weed people. It's like, well, dude, why pick on weed? Weeds, alcohol is way worse. And, you know, what's the difference? And it's sort of a whataboutism. 
Well, as Archbishop Aquila points out in his letter, there may be many purposes for wine and beer, and there were since ancient times. Right? I mean, in ancient times, water wasn't always safe uh, because of in- infection or whatever, and fermenting or brewing it or whatever became a safer way to consume water. Now, we don't have that problem today. You can drink clean water. But the fruit of the vine is a major part of Scripture. I mean, so much so that it becomes a typology in a sacrament, right? Jesus at Cana turns water into wine as a foreshadowing, indicating the sort of the transformation of our lives to the gospel. The Eucharist is celebrated with wine, not grape juice like in Protestant circles, but actual wine. Because these agricultural products are part of the natural processes and they contribute to human life, Scripture tells us, in many positive ways. So they provide calories and they hydrate. And anyone who's had a cold beer after working outside on a hot day in the sun can testify to that. And they can be consumed in moderation without leading to drunkenness. Again, the church doesn't condemn wine or beer, but it does condemn consuming them to excess for the purpose of getting drunk. And we've all known people like that. Some of us may have even been people like that in the past. Drinking to get drunk. That's wrong for all the reasons we've discussed here. If you sit down and say, I'm going out to the bar tonight or I'm going to sit down tonight and my purpose, my end, my goal is to drink so that I can get drunk. Then you're participating in the diminishment of your humanity in the ways that we've talked about. But here's the thing about cannabis. So outside of whatever medical purposes it may or may not have, the only purpose of recreational weed is to achieve intoxication, right? What else is it for other than to give you the intoxicating effect? I mean, you don't use it for calories or hydration or whatever. Its sole end is to efficiently achieve a state of drunkenness. That's it. Why else do you use it? For the intoxicating effect, period. And that's really exacerbated by the cannabis products that we have today. So vaping weed is nothing but a delivery system to get high as efficiently and quickly as possible. And the edibles, like the popular gummies everyone seems to be popping today, convince me that they aren't just a drunk pill. Like, here's a pill in a pretty gummy bear shape that will make you drunk quickly and efficiently. Just pop the pill and you'll be drunk. And, and your breath won't stink and you won't have to go to pee a lot. It, it's basically a perfect delivery system for drunkenness. So, I ask my weed-using friends, why do you use it if not just to get high or drunk or intoxicated or wasted or whatever you want to call it? You're deliberately and efficiently trying to achieve a state in which your intellect, will, and capacity for true love and communion is temporarily diminished. And here's a point that many have made, including Archbishop Aquila in his letter. The cannabis products today are not the pot of the 70s and 80s. So the, in, in marijuana, the active chemical that makes you high is called THC. And the weed products being sold today have 10 times, 100 times the concentrations of THC than the old-fashioned homegrown pot did of 30, 40 years ago, which means that it's not like drinking a glass of wine with dinner or a cold beer while you're mowing the lawn. And the statistics that I've seen indicate that the consumption rate of people who are using these weed products today is more akin to drinking six or eight or 10 whiskey shots all at once really fast. Now, we've all known people, or we've been that person at least once ourselves, that lines up eight whiskey shots and just pounds them down in a line to get as drunk as fast as possible. A lot of us went to college. We did that. That was fraternity rush or whatever. Here's eight or ten whiskey shots. One, two, three, four, bam, 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 to get you blasted as fast as possible. And if you've ever been to that, you've ever done that, you've been around people, it's not a pretty thing. Okay, it's, you know, you think, well, I think it's kind of funny. It's not funny after they do it because it diminishes the humanity in that person. It impacts everyone around them. So cannabis products with high THC content really are just highly efficient delivery systems for getting really drunk really fast. 
And while a lot of weed people will argue that cannabis isn't physically addicting, and personally, I'm not convinced about the research about that. I suspect it's more physically addictive than they admit. But let's say it isn't. It's certainly psychologically addictive in the same way that alcohol becomes psychologically addictive. And we've all known or have been alcoholics and seen what that does to someone's life and the lives of everyone around them when they become psychologically addicted to alcohol. And I'll bet that everyone listening to this knows at least one person in their life, maybe in their family, who has become so psychologically addicted to weed in order to cope with the stresses of life that they can't or won't function without it. They, they can't or won't face life without their weed. Now, society has been here before. During the Industrial Revolution, the streets of major cities were full of bars that kept poor people drunk, which trapped them in cycles of poverty. So in the England of Charles Dickens and all that, these were called gin mills. And if you do a few minutes reading online, look at Wikipedia, whatever, gin mills, you'll find out how devastating these were to society. And if you believe the stories, at one time, the U.S. government used alcohol to pacify Native Americans on the Indian reservations. They spread alcoholism and they eroded the culture and the economies of the reservations in a sense to kind of keep them passive. Now we're doing that with legal weed. So if you're a high-functioning professional with a great income that likes your little edibles while you watch Netflix, you don't care what I think anyway. You're probably not listening to this podcast. But look at what's happening to the most vulnerable people in our society. Trapped in cycles of poverty, poor education, lack of ambition, no work ethic, uh, no good family models. They stay high every day with highly concentrated THC products, all supplied by wealthy companies in league with state governments making bucks and tax base on this. It, it's like lottery tickets and gambling. I said earlier, it's essentially a regressive tax on the poor that keeps them poor. And I think that's immoral. So ask yourself this about the stoners or potheads or enthusiastic cannabis consumers that you know. Do most of them have ambition? Do most of them have a work ethic? Do they aspire to virtue? Do they even aspire to grow in prudence and justice and fortitude and temperance? Do they grow in prayer? Do they grow in devotion to Christ and service to others? Because I think it keeps them numb and not caring about those things. That's my observation. Because like alcoholics, they're constantly inebriated. It has diminished their human qualities like that airplane that's stripped of its wings, engine, and cockpit. Not only can't they get airborne in life, they don't even try anymore. So whether you're the person that's chug-a-lugging a bottle of whiskey to get drunk fast or you're vaping or popping cannabis gummies to get high as quickly and efficiently as possible, it's at the cost of your own humanity. And you will cause so much collateral damage in the lives of everyone around you that it's just tragic. As I've said several times in this episode, Catholicism teaches us that our humanness, our telos as human beings, is expressed in our intellect, our ability to know what is true, good, and beautiful, our will, the ability to choose the true, good, and the beautiful, and to reject what is false and evil and ugly and our capacity to truly love others and give of ourselves in communion with them. And I can't see how consuming a product that has no other purpose but to quickly and efficiently diminish those qualities, something that's essentially a drunk pill or a drunk vape, helps us to achieve our human potential, helps us to flourish in our humanity, helps us to grow in the virtues. Okay, that's not everything that can be said about Catholicism and weed. Please read Archbishop Aquila's pastoral letter that they may have life. I've linked it in the episode notes. And if you're trapped in a cycle of addiction to alcohol, marijuana, drugs, or other things that rob you of your intellect, will, and capacity to love, and that might be things like porn, which essentially does the same thing, then please seek help. 
through authentic Christian or Catholic recovery ministries. And if someone you love is trapped in this kind of cycle, don't enable them. Talk to your pastor or your priest. Pray for help and seek it. The Lord is merciful. This went on a lot longer than I thought because I got kind of passionate about it. But thanks for listening. Please follow or subscribe to the podcast. There'll be a follow or subscribe button on your podcast platform. Really helps us to, you know, become more visible to searches. And please rate and review the podcast. That really helps us to become more visible. And visit the website, consideringcatholicism.com. All the episodes are there, categorized, searchable by topic. And would you consider supporting this ministry financially with a one-time or recurring gift so that we have the time and the tools to help more people learn about and consider Catholicism? Thank you for your time. God bless. Mm -hmm.